Welcome back, everyone. We will now start with a policy panel, which will be moderated by Claire Jones. And the participants are Mark Carney, Mario Draghi, and Stanley Fisher. And Claire, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you. The past 20 years have been an era of transformation for the central banks, not just in Europe, but I think beyond in all of the advanced economies. We've seen unprecedented measures in response to the global financial crisis, and some of what's happened has led to fundamental questions about some of the tenets of how to do central banking best. We've also seen a lot of attention cast on central banks. They've been in an incredible um, spotlight, and you've really seen that lead to fundamental questions about their independence too. The people that we have on stage today have played a vital role in this era of transformation of the central banks. So without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to the Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank, you uh, thank you very much, Claire. I'm going to use the lectern. Uh, it gives me an air of authority. And uh, I also brought some pictures to uh, distract you. I was asked, uh, the theme of this, uh, the topic is past, present, and future, I think. was, uh, And I was given the past. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, you know, I was I was the future once, but now I'm now in the past. Uh, but it's an honor to be on this uh, this panel, um, and I, I do want to start uh, with a caveat, the usual caveat that. Uh, past, uh, the past provides no guide to future performance. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is actually uh, my reflections are about history alone. I'm speaking during the blackout period of the uh, MPC. We have a, uh, those who follow us, uh, we have a rate decision coming out on Thursday. So my comments have no bearing whatsoever on that decision. There are no messages coded uh, or clarion in what follows. There are no messages about policy. Uh, but there's one uh, message that uh, I wanted my presence here today uh, to convey, which is to, uh, is to pay homage to President Draghi's extraordinary leadership of the ECB, the ESRB, the FSB, and by example, of the G7 and G20. Uh, as uh, you heard in the introduction, it's been an extraordinarily uh, challenging uh, period, but these challenges have been met. Uh, not least because of Mario's leadership, his innovation, and his determination. Now, um, thank you. That's, that's all I have. Uh, <laughs> it's probably the safest thing. Um, so, I'm going to, but why don't I talk a few, uh, say a few words about uh, how policy has evolved over the last 20 years, uh, drawing on the experiences of the ECB and uh, the Bank of England. Obviously, the crisis divides the period into uh, roughly two decades. In the decade prior to the crisis, in both economies, inflation targets were achieved uh, without causing undesirable volatility in output and employment. So Olivier's uh, divine co uh, coincidence, as he reminded us last night. Uh, both regions experienced continuous strong expansions in activity, and it wasn't entirely surprising that uh, those sort of end of history declarations of the great moderation were increasingly commonplace. But of course, as this room knows, uh, underneath that nominal stability uh, masked growing financial imbalances and increasing strains in competitiveness. And the financial crisis would throw sharp release, uh, a relief rather, on a, what was a healthy focus on price stability, how it had become a dangerous distraction. We won the war against uh, inflation only to lose the peace. Uh, and when the music stops, the consequence, uh, consequences for the real economy were dire. In both the euro area and the UK, output fell by about 6%, so similar output fall. Unemployment rose initially by 2.5 percentage points. It took seven years in both our economies for GDP per capita to recover to its pre-crisis levels. Um, and in response, the financial system and the institutional architecture were fundamentally reformed. Um, higher capital requirements, liquidity standards, uh, major reforms to help end big to, too big to fail, um, and implementing macroprudential policies. And to safeguard these reforms, Europe now has the SSM and the ESRB. The Bank of England now house, houses the Financial Policy Committee and the Prudential uh, Regulatory Committee. 
and the independence of those committees and their accountability to their to the people through their respective parliaments are essential bulwarks against the inevitable recidivism that follows a financial crisis. The longer we go without a financial disruption, the more important it is to remember that when it comes to financial stability, uh, success is an orphan. Now, since the crisis, growth in both the Euro area and the UK has been on average about a percentage point lower than uh, prior. Inflation has been twice as volatile. Um, and there has been a persistent margin of spare capacity with unemployment on average over the period about one to one and a half percentage points higher. Um, but this is where the two economies uh, diverge. Um, the euro area has continued to experience divine con coincidence. The UK has not. Um, uh, in the euro area, inflation has averaged half a point below target, ref reflecting in part a drag from persistent slack. In contrast, UK inflation has been above target. It's averaged 2.3% 2, 2, 2 during a period when the economy there was operating substantially below potential. And that reflects uh, the inflationary impacts of two large de uh, depreciations and quite substantial pass-through, as well as weak productivity growth that offset, more than offset, what was uh, a very large and positive supply shock in uh, the UK labor market. Now, in these circumstances, it's been critical for the Bank of England to utilize the flexibility under its remit. And we were fortunate, uh, part, it was partly by design, but we were fortunate that in 2013, that remit was clarified, uh, the ability to elongate the horizon over which we returned inflation uh, to target in order to avoid causing undesirable volatility in output and in fl uh, employment. And we have used that flexibility, uh, most notably following the referendum uh, when there was uh, large depreciation in anticipation of significant real impacts that have not yet uh, occurred. Now, in response to this challenging uh, environment, uh, there have been significant innovations in the conduct of monetary policy, and the President went through uh, those uh, this morning. What I would like to do is to focus on two of those uh, for the balance of my remarks, uh, forward guidance and uh, innovations in central bank facilities. And I would note just on forward guidance, I don't have time to go into this, but it has been part, it's obviously a policy tool, but it's been part of much uh, more, uh, much broader uh, transformations in the communication strategies of both central banks. Um, it's a tool to influence uh, short-term interest rates once the, pulse, once the policy rate uh, approaches or hits the effective lower bound. Um, and the objective of both central banks has been to clarify our reaction functions in a highly uncertain world. Now, I should stop here and say, obviously, in a perfect world, guidance would be redundant. People would know how a committee intends to set rates over the future and how those intentions would adjust uh, to economic developments in all eventualities. In other words, people would see our reaction functions. Um, but the world is uh, complex, we all know that, and people, at least people outside of this audience, don't have endless time to devote themselves to understanding monetary policy. I think we've gathered everybody in this room who, uh, uh, who focuses on these issues. Um, in practice, to, uh, to the credit of the ECB, I must say, um, in practice, guidance can be useful in providing people with information about how the committee, whether it's the MPC or the governing council, sets policy and over time improve understanding and how policy will adjust to news. And this can help avoid unwarranted volatility in interest rate expectations, um, and it can also limit the extent to which the central bank has to move the policy rate to meet the inflation target. Um, and I would suggest that the ECB's experience uh, with forward guidance provides a classic example. Um, as mentioned this morning, uh, uh, first used in 2013. It's evolved over time. Uh, it was used to anchor policy expectations uh, in the wake of the still fragile euro area recovery in the wake of the spillovers from uh, the US taper tantrum. Um, in subsequent episodes, uh, the guidance, ECB guidance on interest rates um, have always been tied to the outlook for inflation. Uh, 
with its time contingent nature becoming more specific, first with links to the duration of asset purchases and more recently to specific calendar dates. Make just a couple points about the Bank of England's use of guidance, um, which goes in part to this divine coincidence point, if I may. Um, we introduced guidance in 2013 at a time when the recovery was just beginning and we wanted to have some flexibility to learn about what we thought was a rapidly changing supply capacity of the economy. We had some sense that there was this positive labor supply shock, but we didn't have a good sense of what it was. And truth be told, we also had a sense that productivity was going to recover uh, quite rapidly. That one uh, we've been, uh, we were subsequently disabused on. Uh, but the point was to learn about supply um, and provide guidance on the reaction function accordingly. Um, and the reason this is important is that up until that point, if you wanted to understand the reaction function of the MPC, various MPCs over its life, you would just have to know what happened to demand. Um, supply capacity taken is given, um, and any time there were periods of accelerating growth and firming business confidence measured by the PMIs, uh, the MPC had always tightened policy significantly. And uh, that's an illustration of the previous reaction function, if it had been followed, I know it looks quite fantastical, but that would have been the path of rates for the MPC if we weren't testing supply, if we weren't real, uh, at least had a sense that pass was not uh, prologue. Um, now, um, and that's why we tied guidance in a time contingent, or in a state contingent way uh, to the unemployment rate as a proxy for supply. And I think the important thing, um, in this was there was a learning about supply, not just by us, but by the market as well, and an understanding of the reaction function. So as the economy, uh, as the unemployment rate fell fairly rapidly, um, market expectations about the future path of policy remained subdued because there was a recognition that this positive supply shock uh, was greater than uh, either they or we had previously thought. In other words, they understood the conditionality of the guidance. Our second use uh, of guidance was to provide guidance on uh, the outlook for uh, the equilibrium uh, interest rate, or R-star. Um, and we linked that to a phrase uh, about limited and gradual interest rates when it came time to tighten policy. Um, uh, we started that about, uh, well, about five and a half years ago. Um, and it's now something that's very uh, familiar. Uh, it's obvious now. Uh, but it wasn't then, uh, and it certainly wasn't then to UK households and businesses, uh, and that's when it mattered uh, the most. And it was effective in anchoring, as you can see over the various time periods, uh, rate expectations, including anchoring them when we began to raise interest rates um, in 2017 and last year. Um, so the experience, I'd suggest, in both the euro area and the UK demonstrates how Guidance can help manage expectations as circumstances change, how it's helped to dampen interest rate volatility and reduce the volatility of rates with the degree of economic uncertainty. And here's an illustration uh, for the UK, um, which is another form of providing uh, mon monetary uh, stimulus. OK. I'll be a little quicker on my second topic, um, which is around liquidity and lending facilities. But I, I, I did think it merited uh, just reinforcing some of the innovation there. Um, early on, this was about market functioning. And Jean-Claude is here. And uh, pay credit, uh, full credit to him uh, and the other members of the Governing Council in, uh, in July, August of 2007. Uh, the ECB acted with uh, speed and, uh, and force. Uh, while well, others held back, actually, with the exception, uh, Steve, of the Bank of Canada would have been the only other uh, bank that acted uh, in similar, uh, in similar uh, scale uh, under David Dodge, um, and consistently innovated uh, with term repo operations and helped lead, again, Jean-Claude, uh, help lead um, the network of central bank swaps that was put together between the SNB, the Bank of England, ECB, the Fed, uh, Bank of Canada, and others, uh, which have been an important part of the, uh, of, of, was a, a crucial part of the architecture at the time. Bank of England was not um, as, our initial response was not as comprehensive. Uh, 
and in part that reflected facilities that really had lagged uh, market developments. We uh, were not able to stabilize the overnight rate nor provide the support the banking system needed. Um, led by the example of the ECB and others, there was uh, rapid innovation. Uh, pay full credit to uh, Charlie Bean and my other uh, predecessors at, uh, at the bank for the innovation that they uh, put in place. We've now formalized those innovations following something called the Winters Review. Um, and we have um, recently, um, and I, I just want to mention this uh, in this setting, um, uh, as part of our contingency planning for Brexit, uh, we have activated um, uh, the Euro swap line with the ECB. Um, uh, which backstops um, uh, financial institutions. Uh, this is crucially underpinned by our open and transparent communication and widespread and deep uh, supervisory cooperation. And it is a testament um, to the commitment of central banks, the commitment of the ECB, the Bank of England, uh, to maintaining the stability of the system to the benefit of all our citizens. Um, I'll finish up by just making the point uh, which uh, is crucial, of course, liquidity facilities um, or the facilities, central bank facilities, not just about firefighting, not just about addressing market dysfunction, um, but also uh, a way to provide stimulus. Um, the experience of um, uh, the ECB's experience with the three-year uh, Teltro, um, that helped, or the Eltro, rather, um, helped uh, the Bank of England innovate with the funding for lending scheme. Um, we built on that experience with something called uh, the term funding scheme in August 2016. Um, and I'll draw a parallel to the Teltros of the ECB in 2014 uh, and subsequent variants. In, in these cases, uh, effective ways of <coughs> pardon me, lowering the effective lower bound um, and it's maintaining margins or maintaining the ability of the uh, core of the banking system to pass on the stimulus of uh, lower uh, rates. And I, I note the, uh, the president's comments uh, this morning in that regard. OK. Um, finish up where I started. The last 10 years have seen a number of innovations uh, in the conduct of monetary policy. I've only focused on two. Um, but in these, as in so many other respects, uh, Europe has a rich past. And it's in part uh, because of that that passed, uh, in this case, uh, the innovation of the ECB, that it has the possibility of a brighter uh, future. But I am not the future. I am the past. And to move to the challenges faced by central banks today, I'm going to hand over to Stan Fisher. Thank you very much. Well, the uh, ECB is getting us used to uh, negative interest rates by showing us negative amounts of time uh, <laughs> just there on the board. So I'd, I'd better get going. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, three topics. One is um, the concern now uh, evident in the United States about the failure of infl inflation to rise to 2% and what to do about it. Uh, the second is to ask what's going to happen at the uh, FOMC meeting that is happening today and uh, tomorrow, on which I have no inside knowledge whatsoever. And thirdly, I want to talk briefly about central bank independence. So um, the uh, interest rate, you know, would the, the US ha has a monetary policy well de fully declared of uh, seeking to get keep inflation at uh, 2% and uh, asking for uh, full employment. And those things, the full employment one is not, uh, is not uh, it doesn't have a, a, a number attached to it in the uh, agreement or in the statement by the Fed setting out these uh, goals which are consistent with the law but were in fact chosen by the Fed in 2011. The uh, problem that has arisen is that the uh, inflation rate has not risen to 2% since then uh, for any length of time, and uh, that expectations of inflation are 
below 2%, 1 1.8, 1 1.7, 1 1.6, rates like that, and people are getting very worried about whether the failure of interest rates will themselves be part of the reason why the interest rate doesn't, uh, sorry, the failure of expectations of inflation uh, don't rise to uh, 2%. It will be one of the reasons why uh, 2% looks out of uh, reach. Now, what is it that's prevented uh, the interest rate, uh, the inflation rate rising to 2%? The main explanation is that secular stag stagnation is the problem. Uh, this is Larry Summers' uh, main argument, and it is that the uh, real interest rate has fallen substantially, and that is undoubtedly uh, true, as Olivier argued last night. Now, the main argument for what has come out about how to deal with this is to raise the target inflation rate to 4%. Uh, I want to address Olivier's uh, address of last night by saying, first of all, that I agree with a great majority of what uh, we heard, particularly on fiscal policy. Uh, it is uh, stunning that there, it is still very difficult for uh, the major countries to undertake uh, counter-cyclical fiscal policies. And I think we need to actually consider what on earth is going on there that makes it so uh, difficult. The only thing with which I disagree uh, with Olivier is I don't believe it is wise at this stage to say that the target inflation rate should become 4%. Uh, for one reason, this is a big change in the background of what's going on in the economy. An economy running with a 4% inflation rate is very different with an economy running with a 2% inflation rate. I know that because in the revision of the Bank of Israel law, uh, which took place in 2011, the inflation target was set as between 1 and 3%. And that was done with a wide range, not because the central bank was incapable of hitting the inflation rate, uh, hitting the uh, target uh, um, interest rate, but because in a small open economy, the more important number in determining the inflation rate is actually the exchange rate. And uh, I think more important than the interest rate. And it bounces the uh, inflation rate around. My concern about going to a 4% uh, inflation rate is there are a lot of phenomena associated to the, with the level of the inflation rate. One of them is the amount of indexation in the economy. The experience I had as governor dealing with this 1% to 3% target, and most of the time was around 2%, was very simple. 2%, no noise from anybody. 2.3% noise from people who were writing columns, and given how many business papers there are in Israel, it's very difficult to find something new to say about anything. So there will be an article saying something about everything all the time. And uh, those guys would start writing whether it was we shouldn't go down and we shouldn't uh, go up. But by 2.7, 2.8%, the leaders of the unions came to see me. And their, our discussion was very simple. If you can't stop that, we're going to ask for indexation. Well, I was in Israel when they managed to get rid of uh, indexation in the 1980s and early 1990s. It is not a happy situation to run monetary policy in an indexed economy, despite the fact that it all looks so simple. It's not so simple. Dynamics change when you're indexed. The dynamics of inflation change. And what I recommend, I have enormous respect for, for Olivier. And if he's reached that conclusion, it's a conclusion we must take seriously. But we should take it seriously after setting up a panel or a group or something to seriously ask what are the full consequences of changing the inflation rate from 2%, the target rate from 2% to 
And if we reach the conclusion that the changes which uh, may be to some extent the reverse of what happened as we got rid of indexation, if we come up with a conclusion that all the problems that will arise are uh, less costly than uh, doing with low uh, inflation rates below the target level, uh, then maybe make the change. Second issue, the US economy. Well, it's doing reasonably well. You wouldn't know that to listen to the President of the United States. <laughs> the, in, in the interest rate is uh, two and a quarter or thereabouts, uh, and uh, he wants it reduced by a small amount, namely 1%. We would do much better, he says, if we did that. Well, we would in one respect. Uh, I'm sure that it, that would, in fact, increase uh, employment. Uh, it would uh, destroy the independence of the Fed, which I'll come to in a moment. And uh, it uh, is not something which should be done. Now, I want to uh, say that Jay Powell actually knows the law of the central bank. The law of the central bank is that the government is not allowed to give instructions to the central bank on policy. They can intervene to, to say the central bank is getting too big, whatever it is like that, but they cannot give policy instructions. My favorite story on this is from Paul Volcker who said he was only once, uh, it was only once suggested to him by the government what uh, he should do with the interest rate. He said in 1983, which if you can do the arithmetic is a number divisible by four, uh, that he was called, uh, 1983 is bef bef one year before the uh, year of the election, and he was called to the White House. He said he was surprised that he was asked to go to the White House library because he was usually asked uh, to go to the president's office. But that wasn't what happened. So he went in, he knocked on the door, the door was opened. Inside were President Reagan, according to Volcker, looking very uncomfortable, and James Baker. Uh, the person who many of us had last seen shaking hands with uh, the uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Iraq. Um, he went in, they said hello. Reagan, he said, looked uncomfortable. He repeated that a few times. Baker pulled out a piece of paper from his pocket and read it to him. The President of the United States orders you not to raise the interest rate before the elections. <laughs> he said he knew that was an illegal act, and he didn't know what to do. And what he did was to walk out of the room without saying a word. That took a lot of guts. And uh, that was what he did. And the law was with him, so it was OK. I'll come in a few minutes to talk about central bank independence in greater detail because having the law with you at a particular moment of time is not sufficient to be a fully independent central bank. And I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, turning to the uh, FOMC meeting at the present, uh, the markets have somehow got it in their head that it is obvious that there will be three cuts in the interest rate, one after the other. Uh, in uh, the meetings to come, and they're not absolutely certain if this is the first of those meetings or, uh, will, or the first one will be a month from now on the very last two days uh, of July. Where does this come from? It comes from the uh, fact that inflation has been falling and that to some extent uh, the uh, in, uh, employment uh, numbers, particularly for uh, either April or May, I'm not sure which they were, were very low, much below, uh, uh, much below the average. Uh, and the average is pretty high. Uh, 
the average would have produced continued declines in unemployment, the uh, 75,000 number that appeared uh, in uh, whichever month it was, is not enough to maintain the rate of employment and uh, would have resulted in a decline in the employment rate, taking into account that what actually happens depends also on the participation rate uh, of labor. But that belief is in the markets. Now, I, now that I'm in the uh, markets, at least I know the guys who are in the markets, and I listen to their phone calls and their uh, credit uh, and, and the conference calls, uh, they change their minds with r remarkable speed. <laughs> and they change them uh, for long periods based on short term results, which I find surprising. But they uh, do it. And I think. If, if anybody ever said what you see in the markets is herd behavior, I would think on the basis of what I've seen that while it's not the whole herd running at one time, it is very quick to shift uh, its equilibrium. So we'll see what happens. Uh, the people I know do not believe this is going to happen at this rate. And I'm not talking about people in the Fed. I wouldn't ask them. They wouldn't tell me. And uh, so uh, you may, I, you, what, what, what happens uh, will be whatever it is, with the fact that the Fed is not, is not subject or should not be subject to uh, orders by the uh, President of the United States. I'd like to talk a little bit about central bank independence. The Fed is an independent central bank. Uh, in what sense? In the sense that I specified a moment ago, the government cannot give orders on monetary policy actions to the Fed or the chair of the FOMC, who happens to be the chair of the uh, Fed, Fed, Federal Reserve Board. And uh, until very recently, uh, presidents understood that this was a thing to be very careful about. Uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, was said to have uh, chewed out the chairman of the Fed on occasions. Uh, and uh, he uh, used his bulk and his big fingers to great effect, because there are pictures of him putting his finger more or less in the eye of the uh, chairman of the Fed. So there was. That sort of threat, but it has never taken the form it is taking at this time. And this is serious for a simple reason, not what happens right now, although it is serious because of what happens right now. Namely, nobody knows how to get the president's views into, the, uh, into their expectations of what's going to happen. It becomes much more important in the fact that the chairman of the Fed is, is nominated for only a four-year term. That's what uh, Jay Powell has. And the next nomination, if the president wins the election, will be by the president. And that would produce a very different monetary uh, policy. And when that happens, there will be a lot of questions to ask. Uh, People in this room will be interested as to whether the liquidity loans that were made in the last financial crisis will be made in the future. There is no legal basis other than that the Fed's got to do whatever it uh, can to secure its loans. There is no legal basis saying that's a permanent feature of the environment. It's something the Fed did. It looked all right. At the time, it was done again in the last crisis. Whether it would happen, given the general view of this government, is not at all clear. I hope it will be done. I don't know if it will. Final concern. I'm now at minus six. So, I, so far, the number is about minus six. You should know uh, how far we can go into negative territory. Uh, <laughs> 
the, uh, the lender of last resort function was reduced by the Congress in Dodd-Frank law. The Fed has less freedom now to make lender of last resort loans than it had uh, before. I find this very bothersome. Some of the people I know in the Fed say, well, when the crisis comes, the government won't have the guts not to provide the money that we request. Great statement, but this government has had the guts to do a lot of things that a lot of governments haven't done before. And introducing that level of uncertainty into the handling of a financial crisis is not a good idea, but it is likely to be what happens. So I don't know uh, where, where the dynamics uh, of all this uh, goes, but I'll conclude with a story about Professor Robert Solow, who uh, told me over a lunch one day, after at the end of it, he said, you know, Stan, this was at the beginning of the, uh, of the Trump administration. He said, you know, you're interested, you're, you're worried about a set of things about which I'm also worried. I don't like the fact that they pulled out of the uh, climate agreement. I don't like the fact that they pulled out of the uh, Asian uh, uh, trade agreement. I don't like, and he went on with, with a variety of things that I'd said. He said, I have only one concern, that I, if he is re-elected, we, we will have become a third world country. Hard to believe, but in terms of the way the government is being run, uh, it is something worth putting in with a positive probability. I don't know what that probability is but uh, nor does anyone else. Thank you. Thank you, Stan, for those very pertinent and I would say timely remarks. To, to remain in the present for a little bit, um, President Draghi, you you made some remarks this morning, and it was noticeable that you were rather gloomy on the present set of economic circumstances that we see. So it would be nice, I think, if you could elaborate on those a little bit and maybe deal with this concern, this nagging suspicion that a lot of people have that no matter what the situation is, the ECB maybe lacks the firepower to really deal with it. Thank you. Well, first of all, let me thank Mark and, and Stan for their comments, and uh, Mark for his kind words. Um, the, the business cycle has been continuously softening uh, and output growth with it uh, all throughout the 2018, most of 2018, most of last year, and continues to do so now. Um, there was a gradual acknowledgement uh, about the factors that uh, have caused this slowdown. First, uh, 2017 was an exceptional year, and so the first reaction was, well, we are going back to normal. Then there were some so-called temporary factors, mostly in the car industry in Germany, uh, chemical industry, pharmaceutical industry, several, but they were all rather uh, one-off factors, and the reaction was, oh, these are temporary, and the next quarter will rebound. Well, rebound was there, but much less than expected. The temporary was a little longer than expected, and still, it's going, it's softening. Um, now, the third cause is actually the uh, uncertainty that uh, the, rise in, the rise in protectionism and the language has been used to question the uh, basis of the multilateral order in which we live since the Second World War, to question uh, the institutions that have so far uh, supervised and cared about our international relations and the exchanges are being put into question. So all this lingering uncertainty it's been continuing now for several months. Now, we 
have issued a se several, uh, several macroeconomic projections during this period of time. And from time to time, like uh, we did in March, we've acted, but we always kept the risk tilted to the downside in spite of the action that we had taken because of this lingering uncertainty. In other words, what's happening is that this is not any longer a risk, but the very fact that this uncertainty is so protracted and continue to be there by itself is a materialization of such a risk. So that's what we see. The second thing we see, but we still see some strong data. We still have a strong labor market. Employment continues to increase. As I've said on and on and on, now we are at 11 million jobs created over six years. It's never happened before in this part of the world. I think it's even more than in the United States over this stretch of time. We, we, still, we have actually a nominal wage growth, which is above, substantially above historical average. It's depending on how you read it, it's between 2.6 and 3% on average, which means in certain countries, the core countries is higher than that. <laughs> but all our, first of all, in spite of that, the pass through, it, uh, it's not there. I mean, it just goes very, because the, it goes very, very slow, slowly, uh, because, and, and core inflation remains by and large muted. And so we have, we have these um, survey indicators that continue to point downward. Now here, there is a certain disconnect between uh, the current data, which as I said, not, they're, they're, not, they're, not, uh, they're not bad. Uh, although the weakening is clearly visible. The survey data and the market-based expectations. And um, so it, our, our inflation path is converging now more slowly uh, than, uh, than before, uh, and this is based, we, we look at a variety of inflation expectations indicators, and some, by the way, some of these market-based inflation expectations uh, indicators have lost some informational content due to technical conditions that have been affecting those markets, especially of, of recent time. But looking at the broad variety of indicators, we see actually that the path of inflation is converging to our aim slower, more slowly than, than, expected, than expected. So given that this is the situation, uh, we, uh, that's why uh, during the speech today, I said, that the governing council stands ready to act. And, um, and now, uh, since, you, since you asked, I'm coming back to my speech and just give the key focal points of the, mess, of the policy message. First of all, the trigger that would, uh, uh, that would basically suggest action uh, is not any longer, as uh, actually I, I myself has said in the last press conferences, if, uh, something like if uh, adverse contingencies were to materialize, then we would stand ready to act. But rather, in the absence of improvement, such, a sustain, such that the sustained rate of inflation to our aim is threatened, additional stimulus will be required. And this is exactly because of this lingering uncertainty that that by itself is a materialization of risk. Second, there was a reaffirmation of symmetry Given uh, the, the difficulty of clarifying this concept, I want to be absolutely crystal clear that our aim is symmetric. And um, third, uh, there is a, a sentence which is, I think it's, it's, uh, it's important. That it said, we remain able to enhance our forward guidance by adjusting its bias as we've done in the past, but also its conditionality to account for variations in the adjustment path of inflation. And all this, this sentence here, applies to all the instruments of our monetary policy stance. So it does apply to further cuts, further possible cuts in interest rates, where again there is a change here because it says further cuts in policy interest rates and mitigating measures to contain any side effect side effects remain part of our tools. In other words, we basically, this, we, 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 we view the, the implementation of mitigating measures as part, as part and parcel of uh, a possible rate cut. And finally, uh, there is a sentence about the headroom we have uh, uh, as far as the asset purchase program is concerned with respect to the uh, existing volumes, but also the sentence about the limits 
and uh, it says the APP still has a considerable headroom. Moreover, the treaty requires that our actions are both necessary and proportionate to, feel, uh, to fulfill our mandate and achieve our objective, which implies that the limits we establish on our tools are specific to the contingencies we face. If the crisis has shown anything, it is that we will use all the flexibility within our mandate to fulfill our mandate. So these are the key points of the policy message of that, uh, that I gave this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And while you and others were speaking this morning, others were tweeting, notably the, the US president. Uh, would you care to respond to the sense that some of the actions that you're considering are taking are unfair and that you would be engaging in currency war type behavior by acting? But look, we, we have our remit, we have our mandate. Our mandate is price stability defined as a, a, a rate of inflation which is close but below 2% over the medium term. I just said, a moment ago that we are ready to use all the instruments that are necessary to fulfill with this mandate. And we don't target the exchange rate. Thank you. And over the... <laughs> Over the past 20 years, we've seen the euro's use as an international currency rise, and yet the sense is that the dollar is the, you know, it continues to dominate as the, the global reserve currency of choice. 20 years from now, do you think we'll have a situation where the euro and perhaps other countries too, uh, sorry, currencies too, are as influential as the dollar is today? There has been a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of talk and diverging views about whether the euro um, should uh, have an international role as an objective. And therefore, a, a, even in the early stages of the euro, actually the discussion was much more at that time, where uh, there was a part saying uh, we should promote, enhance the international role of the euro and another saying no because our policy, our monetary policy is unavoidably going to be affected by this larger international role of the euro. I don't, we, we, we can do, it, it, no matter what's the view there, um, one, it's doubtful that you can actually actively pursue policies that would make the euro internationally more important, but rather one should ask, why is the euro less important than the US dollar? And the reasons are pretty obvious. Uh, we don't have a banking union finished. We don't have a capital market union. We don't have a safe asset, common safe asset, completely riskless, where the world can invest its money. I think if we do this, the euro will become naturally important as the US dollar. Would any of the other um, panelists care to respond? I mean, what, what is your view? Does the, Ms. Fisher, does the, the political situation in the US today risk weakening the dollar's dominance at all? Can you see other currencies, the euro included, making more headway in terms of their global use? Well, I think we should have mentioned the uh, Chinese currency as something that 20 years from now could be uh, competing with, with uh, the dollar. It's certainly a goal of the Chinese government. Uh, and typically when they set out to achieve something, they uh, do that well, at least uh, in this uh, era. Um, I don't have anything very much to add to what uh, Mario said. He said it all so beautifully uh, and uh, so clearly. Uh, that uh, I don't see much more. I don't think that the, the, that the United States will make a positive effort to uh, fight 
what, uh, whatever the uh, policies on the euro are, uh, unless they improve the uh, balance of payments of the, of the uh, European Monetary Union countries. Connie? Well, just quickly, um, you know, these things go on for longer than they, quote, should. Um, uh, there's huge network effects uh, being the reserve currency. Uh, you know, we're still in a world where 50% plus of global trade is uh, invoiced in the dollar. 70% of uh, reserves are in the dollar. Um, depending on how you count it, roughly the same proportion of the world's currencies are either directly tied or shadow uh, the dollar. And that is self-reinforcing. So it will, and yet the US is, you know, 15 percent plus uh, uh, or so of uh, PPP uh, global growth. Um, that asymmetry between its importance in the system and its relative real weight is causing bigger and bigger strains in the global monetary system. But it isn't in and of itself self, uh, self-correcting. And I, I guess my, my comments would be, A, it's going to go on for longer than you'd expect, first point. Secondly, that uh, as exactly as Stan said, the internationalization of the renminbi will uh, be as important for an eventual adjustment. But very much as Mario just said, um, that I mean, these goods are goods in and of themselves, a common safe asset uh, banking union and a capital markets union. They happen also to be a pr prerequisite to be in the top tier of global uh, reserve currencies. Um, last point is that. Uh, in general, this has shifted with relative economic weight. And the question is uh, that the added layer of complexity that comes with this is whether um, changes in technology and the nature of uh, the system itself uh, will either accelerate or, or broaden, uh, create the ability actually to have uh, multiple reserve currencies, which has always been talked about, but in actual fact, extremely difficult to have because it tends to switch uh, to one or another. And when we asked people on Twitter to put forth questions to the panelists, one of the issues that came up a lot was... One, one um, came up from uh, the president, actually. Uh, I think that was more asked, ad hoc. Yeah. But, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the issues that did come up a lot was that of digital currencies, of central bank digital currencies, but also of digital currencies in general. Today, we've seen the launch of the Facebook digital currency, the Libra. So. Would you be able to offer us your thoughts on that development? Well, um, a couple of comments. First, let's put it in context, um, which is that there is a, I don't think it's an overstatement to say there's a revolution going on in payments. Um, it's very unequal, though. Um, in some jurisdictions, you can have real time, bank to bank, instantaneous, and very low cost payments, and in others, not, including many advanced economies. Uh, it's still extremely expensive uh, to send money across borders. Um, and a lot of people are unbanked effectively because of that. So uh, that needs to change, and the technology is there to change. And so it's into that context that something like Libra comes. Um, and so uh, I think we need to have an open mind about its, uh, its potential utility, first point. Second point is that. Um, Anything that works in this world will become instantly systemic and will have to be subject to the highest standards of regulation. So that's of operational resilience, including cyber. It's of anti-money laundering, uh, counter-terrorist uh, financing uh, protections. Um, it would include uh, something being effectively an open platform so that others can join and it's seamless. Uh, data privacy uh, would be required. And then as central banks, we have to look at the, how the system's evolving to ensure that we can continue to deliver what people expect. They may not be able to quantify it, but they know when it's not there, monetary and financial stability. Um, and uh, so you would expect um, that, uh, and well, I mean, it's clear that uh, this development, we will look at it very closely and in a coordinated fashion at the level of the G7, the BIS, the FSB, and the IMF. Um, and uh, so open mind, but not open door, highest standards. And the other topic that came up a lot was the issue of climate change and how central banks will consider that in the monetary policy and financial stability remit too. Is that 
you, you like to. Me. This is, <laughs> since I'm uh, now this, I'm, I'm drifting into the future here, but uh, that's uh, that's okay. It's, it's not going to affect okay. uh, the, 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 so the so Thursday. So. But uh, no, it also uh, it's um, a number of us here, uh, Klaus Knott, uh, Francois uh, Villa de Gallo, and others that were part of uh, our institutions, um, uh, part of the network for greening the financial system, ECB as well. Um, Fifty percent of global GDP and emissions, um, and uh, you know the the, the key legs of this um, are first and foremost, well, first, information, getting the right disclosure. Um, you now have, and I'll, I'll, I'll spare you the detail, but the punchline is a almost 120 trillion, 110 trillion euros of assets, I'll put in euros, of assets that has signed up looking for this disclosure. So the users of capital have to start providing it, the TCFD disclosures. But then the issue is, is it's not just about static car carbon footprint, it's about the strategy and strategic resilience, and it's looking at risk management over time because the issue with climate, as pertains not to the reinsurance sector or the insurance sector, but to the core of the financial sector, the risks are around the transition, the risks and opportunities are around the transition towards a uh, low carbon uh, economy, or if you're in the case of the UK and soon to be, I suspect, other major advanced economies, a net zero carbon economy, and that uh, you know, it is, it's going to be the responsibility of financial institutions to have thought through how that adjustment is going to take place, where their exposure is, where their opportunity is, um, and, uh, and as a consequence of that, uh, it, it is uh, very much uh, top of mind uh, for, uh, for central banks and supervisors. Okay. I'd like to throw it open now to questions from the audience. Can we have some, please, first question. Should we take three at a time? Yes. You go first. Thank you. Sylvester Eifinger. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I want to go back to the issue which was laid by uh, Stan Fischer about central bank independence. Well, we, we had 25 years ago a conference at the Netherlands Bank about a framework for monetary stability where you were also included about central bank independence. Uh, we were at that time convinced that central bank independence was here to stay. Uh, actually, we are now confronted with the rise of populism in the US, in the UK, and also in Europe. And my great concern, although I'm a proponent of central bank independence, I worked on that for 25 years, my great concern is that we perhaps are entering an era of fiscal dominance and monetary accommodation in Sergeant Wallen's terms. Uh, maybe the period of central bank independence, of monetary dominance, was maybe an exceptional period in history of 25 or 30 years. Uh, I hope not, but if so, what should we do about it? Uh, what should central banks do about it in terms of communication policy? Should we communicate better with the public at large? Or should we maybe... Uh, go also uh, accommodate to these wishes of these populist uh, uh, politicians. Uh, I hope not, but my question to the panel members, all panel members is, how should we deal with populism in the future? Okay. Um, and then, so Blanchard, can we just bear in mind as well when um, questions are being asked that the, the governor of the bank is in is in the PERDA period, so no questions directly on monetary policy, please. So, Olivier? No. Um. Thanks. I, I feel I have to uh, answer Stan. I think he has raised a, a very important issue, which is that if there was a level of target inflation which led to the indexation of wages... Can you speak up? Well, I, you know, the mic is about as close to my mouth as can be. <laughs> Next, I swallow it. <laughs> so I, I fully agree with Stan that if uh, level of average inflation or target inflation was such that it led to the indexation of wages, this would be a major setback for monetary policy. It would have us go back from the current Phillips curve to an accelerationist Phillips curve, and it's clear that monetary policy is much harder 
uh, to, uh, to, to do in that context. So I fully agree. So the question is, what would trigger it? Stan may remember that my PhD thesis, that he was the advisor to, uh, was on the indexation of wages. And uh, so then, I basically looked at what was happening in the US, and I'm sorry, but I don't remember the exact numbers, but my impression is that indexation actually disappeared in the US at levels of inflation higher than 2%. It's an empirical issue as to what level would actually trigger it. And I fully agree that if you convince me that that 3% or at 4%, by the way, I didn't mention 4% yesterday, but I've mentioned it in the past. Uh, it would actually be a serious issue. So I fully agree that that should be taken into account. Okay. Uh, yes, I will yes, answer so at the end, end I think. Yeah. 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 And then just one more, and then yeah. a few answers mm -hmm. first. Ben Friedman from Harvard. Uh, I wonder whether uh, central banks are not uh, getting caught in a kind of uh, path dependence. We all know that path dependence is a form of you can't get there from here, or the past uh, dictates the usual uh, presumption, uh, the usual example is the keyboard on the typewriter. It had, uh, had the kind of t keyboard we have now had a purpose at one point. It's now counterproductive. At least in the United States, there's now a great deal of discussion having to do with the sense that we're skating very close to the thin ice of getting stuck repeatedly at the effective lower bound of interest rates. There's an enormous amount of discussion of what to do about that, but it's all couched in terms that we have to leave the 2% inflation target where it is. Now, why do we have to leave it where it is? Because that's, the answer is because that's where it is. It's, it's a form of path dependence. Uh, we made a decision at one point, and at one point it made sense, I suppose. And now because that's where we are, that's where we have to remain. I think central banks are especially subject to this kind of path dependence because central banks rely, as all three of our speakers just mentioned, on their credibility. And if you believe that your effectiveness depends on your credibility, then of course it's very risky to you to decide that uh, you're going to change what you're doing. But at the same time, it's very important to remember that circumstances in the world change. Real interest rate levels in equilibrium are not necessarily what they uh, used to be. You learn things that you didn't know before about the costs of getting stuck uh, at the lower bound. And in the context of a meeting like this in which we're looking back over the 20 years of success, I would call it an enormous success of the euro, it's important to realize that the conditions that prevailed more than 20 years ago that led to the decisions made then are not necessarily the conditions that prevail today. And therefore, the decisions made today need not be gathered, guided by the conditions that were prevailing a quarter of a century ago. And I wonder whether anybody has a reaction to the notion that central banks, because of this important role of credibility, are more so than other institutions locked into this kind of path dependence in which because a decision was the right decision 25 years ago, it therefore, by presumption, has to be continued regardless of whether objective conditions gave rise that gave rise to it still prevail. Okay, do you want to go first? Uh, uh, ben, uh, I uh, don't accept that uh, there's a mindless path dependence. We have finally established in the industrialized and developed world what a stable currency is. It's a currency which has 2% inflation. 
we also have got considerable belief in, the, uh, in what the central banks are trying to do, although it's being eaten away and may end up being eaten away entirely uh, by the failure of the inflation rate to get to the uh, target level. But on the day we move to 4%, we have changed what the inflation rate is in monetary policy. It is no longer the variable which we are trying to hit all the time. It is something that when it's inconvenient will change. Now you can say that's very uh, sensible. But it is not that simple to change the unit of account. And that's what's being asked of us. So I think this is a much more serious issue uh, than the, the uh, people who say, well, 2% wasn't the, the best number, 4% is. Um, I thought at the time it should have been a range, uh, but not a range that went from 2 to 4%. And that may yet be right. But I'm very, uh, it, the path dependence is a result of the belief that when people get used to something as fundamental as money and its stability, uh, it's what is regarded as a stable currency, that we will be making a major change uh, in the economy if we decide one morning to go from 2 to 4% because it's all very easy to do. Can I make um, two what I view, uh, before I make them, as relatively safe points on this, uh, these questions, safe from my blackout perspective? The first is that uh, uh, you, one of the ways uh, to retain credibility and legitimacy is not to change your own remit. Right? Your remit is given to you by, in the case of the ECB, by uh, the Constitution, uh, in the case of the Bank of England, by legislation and defined, or uh, more precisely defined, by the Chancellor in an annu annual remit letter. So yes, there, is, you know, there can be a place in an academic sense to talk about some of these issues. But what you don't do is stand up and say, well, actually, I'm tired of focusing on this. I'm going to focus on that, first point. Mm -hmm. Second point, uh, I'm going to make three. The second point is one just point to remind, and I think people know this, but it bears repeating. The Bank of England has a very wide range of responsibilities, including huge responsibilities in terms of macro prudential and micro prudential insurance and other uh, uh, responsibilities come, and therefore other issues come in. And you know, one of the challenges is explaining, for example, when I answer your climate question, I'm answering it from a macro prudential perspective, not from a monetary perspective, and you can appreciate that. But my third point, and I'll stop on this, which is around legitimacy and, uh, and embedded in one of the first questions, the first question was around communications and, uh, well, issues of uh, what, what can we do to uh, reinforce um, uh, the operational independence, remembering, as you well know, the remit comes from others and we execute against it. One of the issues we think, um, and there's a variety of reasons why this is the case, but one of the, reason, one of the issues we have had and we're trying to address is that the Bank of England uh, doesn't bear that much of a resemblance to the country it serves. Uh, in terms of the diversity of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the senior management of the Bank of England um, um, and the diversity of background uh, as well. And with all due respect to uh, those on the panel and in the audience, I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of Christine uh, Lagarde's comment that uh, she has diversity at the IMF, uh, you know, 100 plus uh, nationalities. They all have uh, PhDs from MIT. Um, so not necessarily diversity of thought. So very quickly, one of the things we've done is we're almost at the point now where we've doubled the number of women in senior management over the last six years. Um, recruiting, we only take half of our uh, intake from economics and finance uh, just to have different perspectives and we're gradually moving uh, to a more uh, diverse outcome, which or, uh, 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 institution so that, and that does help when you go out and talk uh, away from specialist audiences, uh, people are more likely to be reflected. And of course, because all decisions in finance are taken under uncertainty, it does also help to have some different perspectives around the table when you're taking those decisions. I'd like to comment. I, I completely agree with, uh, with, with them. So I just I was thinking about commenting about communication and populism, uh, which was your, your, your question. Um, uh, first, 
on two, on two aspects, actually. One is the channel of communication, and the other one is the audience, who's the receiver of this communication. Uh, in the Eurozone, by and large, communication is based on, uh, in the various countries, is based on the National Central Bank uh, carrying forward the message of the, of the uh, governing council. And uh, I think Volker Wieland this morning was, uh, was recalling what the Bundesbank has done recently, trying to explain some controversial issues like the Target 2, and certainly that's, been, uh, that's certainly been uh, very well done. Uh, now, whenever the National Central Bank has supported the message that was coming from the Governing Council, uh, you could see actually value added. Mm. And the uh, national constituencies, the various uh, people in the various countries, approved, understood, trusted the governing council in Frankfurt. Whenever this didn't happen, you saw the opposite. In fact, they actually stirred populism and populist feelings against the ECB. So that's one word about the channel of communication. So if there is, which, which boils down to saying that if there is discipline, uh, that would be the best response to populism. Because that's the best way to spread clearly the message and content of the governing council's deliberations. The second point is about who's the receiver of this communication, central bank communication. Well, one thing's been said in the last few years, especially recently, but in the last two or three years, is that central bankers should evolve their language. Um, the natural audience of central banks are banks and markets, and policymakers, of course, other policymakers. Now, to, um, to sort of make yourself clearer, speak like normal people, communicate, use simple words, don't use technical jargon, all this is fine in theory. Uh, it, I think all in all uh, it should be done. People should think, central bankers should think about this. But there's one uh, word of caution here. Uh, the, the limit, the uh, borderline between uh, central banks and politics is also drawn by language. Once you stop talking naturally to your, uh, talking to your natural audience, your natural constituency, and you venture uh, into, a different into a different audience and using a different language, you naturally enter into the political sphere. And uh, I could give you several examples of perfectly technical statements that formulated in common language become political statements. So uh, I don't want to make example, specific examples because they don't involve the ECB, but, uh, but that's something to, keep, to be, to be uh, present, to be kept present in mind. Claire, could I just add one thing? Absolutely. Sylvester, there is quantitative work on why 2%, and we should make the argument also in terms of what we know about different rates of inflation and not say, make an argument as if, well, that number was drawn from the hat. Let's see if there's a nicer number in another hat. And uh, we've got to get, get down to what is actually being argued about. OK. Um. Thank you. Um, my question um, has to do with market reaction to the messages we sent. I mean, Mario's um, content this morning uh, was, um, if not in the wording, at least in the spirit, quite similar to the message sent in our last governing council meeting in Vilnius. But markets reacted in a completely different way. I mean, the exchange rate appreciated in, in Vilnius, it depreciated today. Uh, we had a huge fall in yields. Uh, this morning. So, uh, and uh, in my view, President Trump's reaction was not from the content of the speech, but uh, from the market reaction. Wh why do you think that uh, markets react in this way? Uh, I, I, oh. Take one more question. 
Okay. Uh, I, I'd like to to return the, to the issue of central bank independence. Uh, I think the, this morning Ricardo Reis made a very important observation: is that a big danger for central banks is to get close to fiscal policy and redistribution and the whole stuff. Uh, now, over the, since the crisis, a number of central banks have been given responsibilities for bank supervision. Uh, it's a good idea on one hand because there is competence, there is uh, independence. On the other side, supervision has natural uh, fiscal implication, implications. Uh, so my question to the panel is, is this a good thing or should that be a transitory thing after the crisis and eventually shouldn't central bank relinquish this responsibility? Isabel Matteo Silago from BlackRock. Uh, President Draghi, this morning you made a very strong plea for a central fiscal stabilization capacity. Uh, this coming just days after the Eurogroup uh, seemed to have buried it unceremoniously. Um, so a couple of questions related to that. One is, could you spell out what in your view would be the implications of this central fiscal capacity remaining elusive, not happening, the implications for the Eurozone and for the ECB's ability to achieve its mandate? And then secondly, uh, how hopeful um, are you realistically that such a central fiscal capacity will see the light of day uh, in the next uh, few years, let's say? Thank you. Um, maybe I'll pick up uh, Charles's uh, question on supervision um, linked to uh, Ben's point on path dependence. I think in regulatory constructs, there is path dependence. I mean, different. Um, jurisdictions have different histories and experiences and adjustments to it. I will say my experience at the Bank of England, so with that caveat, uh, my experience of, uh, at the Bank of England of having supervision within the same body as monetary policy is there are huge, huge synergies between the two. Uh, and maybe it's particularly in this period of time, uh, but uh, there have been issues uh, around the transmission of monetary policy at these very low interest rates um, and during um, periods of financial innovation. Uh, as in my m remarks, things around facility design, I don't think we would have designed the TFS as effectively as we did if we were not also, couldn't have a direct dialogue with our supervisors of, of the banks. Um, and then the third point, quickly on you know, my diversity point, actually you can get complementary individuals into your organization. You can move them around. You can keep them there longer because they have diversity of experience. I mean, these are very practical things, but they actually uh, actually really matter. So, uh, and you know, the fiscal, where the rubber hits the road on fiscal is in supervision. I know it leads, it's in resolution. It's in that, that point where you go to resolution. Um, uh, now, the Bank of England happens to be the resolution authority as well, so uh, you, but you, I, you know, I would have pointed that uh, uh, question around that. Um, so I, I come, come from a jurisdiction where they've always been separate and I think they'll always remain separate super, in Canada, uh, monetary and uh, supervision. Uh, but because they're like that, there is a closer dialogue, whereas when in the UK, and I'll stop on this, when they were separate, they were really separate. Um, and that really undermines the, uh, the effectiveness of the system. Well, the, the Bank of England was happy when supervision was taken away from it. Uh, some at the Bank of England. <laughs> I, 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 wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't generalize that because it was... Uh, uh, it, it seems to me that when the sum is the head of the organization... Uh, the head of the organization, Eddie George, was not happy about that. That would be... Uh, not at all. Not, Eddie. not at all. So anyway, think, it happened. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, w I would say that uh, the same individual, although he was no longer not the head, uh, was very happy indeed when it was returned to the Bank of England in the crisis. And uh, so they've learned their lesson and... Uh, an expensive lesson. An exp yeah. It was an expensive, le it was indeed an expensive lesson, yeah. yeah. If the final word to the, the president. Uh, I um, just want to answer two, two questions. The first is uh, from Yanis. Uh, 
Uh, number one, we don't target exchange rates. Keep this in mind. Um, <laughs> second, uh, the, um, I mean, I'm not, uh, it's very difficult to, to actually um, to assess to, and explain market reactions to, to our statements. <laughs> Uh, they depend on, um, on many, on several factors, but certainly um, our experience all throughout, you know, the statements we've made many, uh, and uh, they, m many of them had some consequence. Uh, it also depends on how clearly this message is being perceived. Very often messages like, for instance, the, the, the one in the last press conference was quite complex, articulated, so maybe people need more time to filter it through. Um, so that's, I think, it uh, was said before, the markets uh, change their mind very frequently and very suddenly. Well, they also may need more time to, to get the message through, or maybe the message was articulated in a poor way to begin with. So, uh, but that's, uh, that's, what, uh, that's what happens. Now, the second question was about, um, about, the, um, about the central fiscal capacity that uh, is, uh, is not actually pursued with great determination by the policymakers. Well, first, monetary policy will continue to do its job no matter whether, what, what happens to fiscal policy in this part of the world. I've given several examples today of the, uh, of the drawings, the, the shortcomings of not having a central fiscal capacity. The, the fact is that monetary policy will continue to do this, but if there were some, some fiscal capacity in place of some consequence, it could do the same job faster and with less side effects. Think about financial stability. Think about the exchange rate. Think about lots of things. If you had a powerful fiscal policy next to you, of course, there shouldn't be any fiscal dependence and because that would destroy monetary policy, so we would, uh, in a sense, <laughs> backtrack him from our objective. But, uh, but we know what difference it could make. Now, do we need a completely, fully fledged out fiscal instrument where um, different member states, by the way, this appeal, this plea for, for, for fiscal capacity, or fiscal instrument, was, the f was originally put forward by Jean-Claude Trichet when he pleaded for having a minister of finance uh, for the Eurozone, uh, and that's what, um, that's, so um, do, we need to, do we need to have a fully fledged fiscal instrument? No, it's clearly very complex. It's, it's like building an institution, how, what should be its governance and so on. What is needed at this stage is a clear goal post. It's a political statement that in a certain number of years, the Eurozone members will converge and agree in having a common fiscal capacity. Just the very fact of having this goalpost shared by member countries would make an enormous difference. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We give a round of applause to the panelists, please. Thank, Thank you. you. Very well done. Yeah. Very well done. Thank you. Well, you did well. Very well. <laughs>